Welcome back to Peak Performance Radio. Today we have Steve Tajan on the call. Uh, he's the fitness coach at Everton, uh, a UEFA uh, soccer team uh, for people over the pond. It's football. Uh, for people in the U.S., it's uh, soccer. Um, that's a whole conversation I think we could have on this call. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I, I think what I'm going to start off with uh, is how I always start off with all my conversations, which Coach Tajan, first of all, thank you for jumping on this call. I know what the time change is, it's challenging. Um, my first call is when you hear the term peak performance you use today, um, what does that mean to you? I think we try to, um, as, as fitness coaches and performance uh, specialists, I, I think we try to make it something of our own doing. We, we try to maybe define it as uh, the result of the work we do with players rather than looking at it from the terms of the result of the work that's done holistically with the player from uh, the physical side of it to the mental side of it to the technical side of it to the sport coaching side of it. That, to me, is really a better definition for what I think peak performance is. Peak performance, to me... Um, it, I think is better defined by the, you know, a moment in time where an individual is asked to, to you know, to, to perform at a certain level, at an elite level. And it's that moment where it's time to shine and where they're going to be called upon to use every resource, yeah. mental, physical, technical, to, uh, to execute. And that, to me, is, is peak performance. And it's, it's a result of holistic preparation, not just physical preparation. You know, the, the moment, that split second where we need to react, we need to make the right decision, and then we need to create a solution and execute the solution uh, in, a, in an elite way is, is, to me, you know, a better way of defining peak performance rather than uh, something that is anchored in, uh, you know, the number of sets and reps of, of a certain type of exercise we did during the week and a, a certain acceleration or a certain physical attribute I think it's more of a sporting attribute. It's more of the, the a culmination of, of all of the work that's been done to help prepare you for that specific moment. That, to me, I think is, is peak performance. Yeah, I, it always amazes me to hear the answers from all our speakers and what they share with us. I think, I think the, the big message that people could hopefully get from your comment there is that you're talking about a mind-body-spirit uh, component. You know, we cannot leave or can't be just living in one silo at all times. We need to be breaking down these walls and really being open and receptive to this uh, kind of leads me into my next question, which is we have a lot of different types of technology available to us today. And often we get a, a lot of different questions and we get uh, the, you know, the silver bullet or people just look at technology and get paralyzed by information. Uh, we originally met through um, our relationship, so people are aware. I uh, worked at Polar one time, and I worked with you at, when you were at the Columbus Crew, and it was no coincidence you were a leader in, in using um, fitness technology, and you keep on adapting different types of technology. My question is, do you feel that technology today or sports science today has helped you be a better coach? Yeah, without a doubt. I, I don't think there's... Um, I don't think there's ever going to be a time where technology is going to be a bad thing uh, as long as we keep things in perspective in terms of what we use and when we use it. The, the, the thing I always try to focus on is, is this going to help me benefit the players? Is there something within this technology that's going to allow me to monitor them better, train them better, um, inform them better, educate them better? That, that's really uh, probably the, the biggest emphasis I think most coaches need to take into consideration when, when a new technology movement, uh, you know, comes into the industry. For, for me, obviously, early on, like you spoke about, heart rate monitoring was a big thing that came into to soccer slash football, you know, a number of years ago. And then it was the, I think now it's probably leading into the GPS and, and accelerometry maybe even speaking along the terms of HRV and, and those types of technologies that are helping us now. And, and again, it's, it's, it's more about uh, 
how they integrate together rather than what they do in isolation for, for the group of, you know, athletes that you're working with. I've tried to always, I think when a new piece of technology comes out, we have no choice but to focus just on it at first until we understand it, until we truly get a grasp of, of all the information that's coming in and, and what it means and mm -hmm. uh, what it tells us about the players, the type of training that we're implementing, those types of ideas. <clears throat> to the point where now I think we've, we can take, you know, uh, if we take GPS, for example, we can now take GPS, understand the information it's giving us, and now work to integrate it into the entire battery of information that we get from other technologies as well. So I don't care how far I ran on the day. I don't care how far uh, I ran at a certain speed zone on the day. I care more about that particular metric and how it affects other metrics. You know, we've constantly been, we're constantly driving to find out the intrinsic result of our training. Uh, most of the technology that we get really tells us about the extrinsic nature of our training. What's the external load taking place? Well, we want to now start using that to start telling us something about how the, the body is reacting to it from a systems perspective. So mm -hmm. as long as we can take what we have, start to integrate it together, we want it to tell us something. And if a piece of equipment comes in and all it does is continue to tell me about external load, then I need to ask myself, how much of this do I really need? And when is it going to start telling me about what's intrinsically happening within the player? So it's, it's without a doubt, technology is vital to sports science. And the only time paralysis takes place is if we're trying to overthink the process and, and not, again, integrate it and keep the player's well-being and the player's performance as the priority. Uh, that's a, such a great answer. I, I often used to always get the, um, you know, well, I, need a, I need to be a physiologist to understand this data. Or I need to, and I think today um, you don't really have to because, to your point, don't get, uh, don't. It's not about the number; it's about the bigger picture and how it impacts what you're going to do in your all your program, not just one aspect of it. Uh, has it helped you to deal with the um, athlete that has maybe the alpha mindset that thinks that they could always drop the hammer? And cannot you know, and and often wonder why they might be injured, or uh, has it helped you being able to communicate and have a come to Jesus conversation with that athlete? Yeah, I, I think I'm lucky in that I have a group. I can only speak for the group that I have, and they they're very uh, they're hungry for information like this. So anytime I can provide them with information, they they eat it up. They really do appreciate it. So in that regard, I think it does. It does help me explain sometimes the rationale behind certain decisions that we make with resting players or uh, maybe implementing additional conditioning programs, things of that nature. And it gives me information on whether that's the right thing to do uh, from the get-go. So, if, you know, if I obviously have in mind a plan for the week for a particular player, but I'm gaining feedback day by day as the week goes on about what's taking place with the player, I may have to change that program as I get into Wednesday or Thursday I may have overshot the mark or undershot the mark, whatever it might be. So I think the players appreciate that because they see you changing things and manipulating things for their benefit. And, again, it's so that we can get to the Saturday and provide a peak performance because it's not just about the load, but it's also about the recovery. And, and they, 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 definitely, uh, they definitely appreciate that. And, and for those players that tend to maybe, maybe uh, uh, continue to push and push and push without recovery, I think what technology has done is help us be somewhat predictive with these players. If I can continually tell them what's going to happen before it happens, then they'll probably be more likely to listen to me the next time I say, hey, I think this might be the right thing to do. So sometimes it has to be retroactive, and, uh, you know, unfortunately something has to take place before the player will listen. But more often than not, at least we're making educated decisions, and, and the technology allows us to, to make those educated decisions. So I think it plays a huge part in letting players understand what it is we're trying to do, and then also get on board. You know, that's a big thing. So, you know, you, you shared a lot there. Um, what are some um, books and some people that have you've come in that have impacted your life to really mold you and kind of guide you? Because, you know, drawing back to what you just shared with us, technology has helped you, but obviously people have helped you and, um, you know, certain books have helped you. 
What can you share with some people that might want to get a couple steps ahead of where you started off with and might have might refer, you could refer them to? Yeah, I I was I, I consider myself incredibly lucky to have uh, to have met the number of mentors that have really shaped me as as a therapist and and as a fitness coach. I, I had uh, the you know great opportunity with my first job out of school to work with Jim Liston and over at the Competitive Athlete Training Zone, who you know ages ago was was a was a very influential person in terms of. The, my fitness coach side of things, and uh, within that same facility, I, I worked quite a bit with Kevin Wentz, who, who works works with Jim as well as kind of the director of physical therapy there, and just an extremely uh, uh, innovative guy in terms of his dedication and his commitment to function, and I think it taught me a lot about what true function is, and, and he was a big, big part of that. Uh, I think maybe even more powerful was Gary Gray in terms of my progression as a as a fitness coach and and physical therapist. Uh, just an unbelievable guy in general. Even if you were to talk talk to Gary in something that had nothing to do with physical therapy or, or fitness, he would inspire you. So he was a he was a very very influential person in my life and really got me to understand what I think is the true nature of function and and which obviously is the precursor to athleticism. So I think. Those two people, for sure, were extremely influential. I mean, I'm, I have a unique opportunity now to do what I do as an employee of Athletes Performance, and I've met a number of incredible people through through the company, and from from Mark to Nick Winkleman to Shad Forsyth and other guys that I've I've been able to come across and work with. I've just had an unbelievable sounding board to work with. You know, up to this point, my eleventh, you know, twelfth year as a, as a physical therapist and fitness coach. So. Uh, I think people books are extremely important, and you know, to to be well read, I think is important. I don't think I'm as well read as as some others in the industry. I try to do my best to to, to stay with it, but the the people I've met, I think, have been just as influential. I I think personal contact and personal experience is, for me, um, you know, the the real meat and potatoes of of continuing education. As far as books are concerned, I think I've read all the you know, all the gold standards of modern coaches that are, that are kind of at the forefront now with, with Mike Boyle and, and, and Mark and, and, uh, you know, even some others who have, uh, who've done work in the past and, and contributed to the body of what we consider, you know, our modern knowledge in, in strength and conditioning. But, um, I've spent a lot of time just reading books on coaching. I think that's helped me quite a bit as well. And, um, they call me coach by John Wooden is a great book that I've, that I've read a number of times. And, um, uh, the score takes care of itself, but Bill Walsh is, uh, I think, probably one of my favorites. To be fair, "Winning Every Day" by Lou Holtz. Uh, those books are, are, you know, really, really influential things. And then I started to really focus a lot on mindset and some different things to talk about how we think, how we perceive, how that influences our performance. And uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman's book called "Thinking Fast and Slow" has been a really, really uh, good one for me. It's, it's a um, it's a heavy read, and it's taking me time. I'm going through it quite slowly, but um, that's a quite interesting book that I think probably maybe some coaches wouldn't think it'd benefit them as coaches to read. But uh, if you think about understanding how your players think and how your players perceive their performance, how your players perceive their ability to, uh, you know, to, to execute on a weekend, it helps you understand them a bit better. If I understand my players better, I can understand how to train them better. So I think that's a really, really important piece, and... Uh, if I had, you know, in terms of ed educating others and, and how to get to where I am or how to, to progress their careers, you know, I would say in a nutshell that reading is important, but people are more important. So I, I think the mentorship, internship side of things is is far more, not far more beneficial. That's probably the wrong way to say it, but it's, it's more tangible. And I think it probably accelerates the process of learning and, and creating new ideas, um, at least for me, a lot quicker than the, than the reading side of things. No, I think learning monomics is, is unique to everyone, and, and everyone should try every type of um, type of technology or type of yeah. uh, method, to be honest. Um, you mentioned, uh, I took a couple of notes there. Um, I, you, you've worked with Mark Bersteegan, and, I, and, I, and I've met Mark. Um, first of all, he has a, an impressive individual to meet, um, knows what he wants, um, how, what are some things that you can share with, um, you know, working with him 
as uh, as a uh, obviously a, an owner and a person that has a, a great company. What are some things that you can share about him uh, that you feel are um, of strong character to, to share? I think the things I can share most about Mark, uh, unfortunately for me, is sharing what I've learned from the people that he's put in place to, to help him create such a great company. Because my contact with Mark's been limited since most of my time is overseas. I really haven't gotten a chance to work with him. Uh, I will say that in the times I've had a chance to speak with him, you can just tell with in a very, very you know, short amount of time that he's quite an inspirational person in terms of his ability to uplift the people that are around him, encourage the people that are around him, and, uh, and educate the people around him. So I, I appreciate what he's done, and my learning, uh, my, my learning process has been, in, has been indirect in terms of my contact with Mark. And I think that's something to be said, because when you can, oh, yeah. when you can set up to implement a certain uh, system, when you set up to implement a certain, in this case, a company with a certain goal uh, to get somewhere and have an effect on the industry, you, you want to be able to translate that message effectively and then and kind of and then release people to go out and spread the message and, and hope and trust that the message is going to be spread properly. And I, it's, I tell you what, it's, it's as close to hearing it from Mark's mouth as, as you could get in terms of how he's trained and educated his staff. So I have, I have a tremendous amount of respect for him uh, because of the, the way that I see things work with athletes' performance and the way I've been enveloped into the family itself and allowed to express myself personally as an individual, but then have the resources available to really learn from a company like theirs and enjoy being, uh, you know, being associated with, with so many great coaches. So it's, it's been fantastic to be a part of it. And uh, I just hope I get a chance to be in more direct contact with them in, in the near future. No, I agree with you. Uh, I'm impressed that every single athlete's performance facility or um, staff that's been implemented in different professional team sports. Uh, if you walk into all of them, it's the same feel, same overview, uh, same delivery. Um, it's quite impressive. That's why I, I wanted to just have you talk a little bit more about them. Uh, the, the other thing, the other person that you mentioned is Gary Gray. Uh, Gary Gray is an amazing individual. I remember hearing him speak for the first time at an NSCA event where um, he uh, basically uh, delivered his first functional uh, movement lecture. And I just wish I was kicking and screaming because I wish I had him for a kinesi professor or for just an anatomy and physiology professor because I walked out of that session pretty much knowing that I don't know anything really and that there's a lot more to learn. And he just... I think, I think everyone stayed at least another half hour asking him more questions, walking up to the stage. Um, I'm just, that guy I can't say enough about. Um, yeah, I, I, Gary Gray is an amazing individual. It, it, you've experienced a lot here in the States where you get a lot of disruption sometimes from um, marketing or from media uh, glamorizing certain terms. Um, functional training is one. Um, there's other modalities, but how does that impact you as a strength coach when you're supposed to deliver training to a team and maybe a coach or a player gets influenced from reading or seeing something on ESPN or, you know, or, hear, or getting an interview question and, and then you have to deal with it? How has that impacted you in the States as well as in, in where you currently are? I think it, it's probably it probably affected me more in the states than it has here. Um, I think probably the first big one you mentioned the term functional training, and there was a time there where you know anyone that would take a client, stand them on a on a bosu ball with a medicine ball in their hands, and and throw it back and forth off a rebounder, said that they were you know implementing functional training, and that was. I came down to a, uh, a somewhat of a convenient way of, you know, differentiating yourself from, from the rest of, you know, the personal training community that was there at the time. And, and that's become, 
yeah. early early days it was a problem because I think when we were when when you try to either start your own facility or start your own career dedicated to a certain craft, you don't want it to be diluted by others who, who might be using the same tag but not really understanding truly what function is. And so that did affect me quite a bit uh, from the standpoint of maybe working with clients who had been with other practitioners uh, who had told them, you know, one way was gospel and then trying to really explain what the true meaning or true movement was and, and having just a little bit of resistance from that to try to kind of create the correct understanding of what was taking place. But you, you mentioned like it was I think gospel. Then I kind of led into that. I'm sorry, you mentioned it was gospel. I remember, <laughs> I remember one time it was it happened during the Gary Gray conversation, yeah. where um, we were at the event and there was one coach very passionate about Olympic lifting, right. and Gary Gray basically said you don't necessarily need Olympic lifting to make right. a better athlete, yeah. and it was like basically um, the Gaza Strip for a second, and, was, <laughs> and uh, it was just funny. I'm sorry, I. I That's have okay. to I've, hey, listen, that. I've seen a number of those moments with Gary, so don't, don't worry about yeah. it. I understand it. I think initially when you when you sit down and you hear somebody like Gary speak, the first thing you do is you question what you've been doing for a really, really long time. And some people, some people honestly, you, you get different reactions. Some people are very humble about it, and they think, wow, I, I've got something here that I can really take advantage of. I can either listen to it and try to incorporate it into what I do slowly and and try to see if I can think a little bit more outside of the box. So you get others that get very defensive and think, I'm being told I'm doing it wrong here. And that can create a very, very interesting reaction. And some people, it's just, it's just understandable. Don't get me wrong. Because uh, I think you even, you know, I hadn't even been a therapist for very long when I got to, really uh, work with Gary, and that uh, probably was the reason why I didn't give him a whole lot of resistance. I didn't have enough experience to really give him any resistance. Others who had been therapists for 15, it can have different reactions in different people. But I think the, um, you know, the, 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 as I think most practitioners in general have, uh, you know, they, they, they're coming from a good place. They want to help people. I don't think they will purposely take on a particular tag or, or title their training, a certain type of training, to attract clientele uh, and not have the purpose of actually trying to help them. So uh, 100%, that's not what I'm saying. What I think is taking place is sometimes there's an advantage to labeling things a certain way and packaging it so that it can be sold in a certain way. And that's, that's where it becomes a problem. I think, I think the word core, without a doubt, uh, uh, had the same problem, you know, core, core training, core this, core that, just, it, it got so associated with the abdominal region alone that it, it, it was, it, it became very, very difficult to get people to understand that core is not an area, core is not a, a, an isolated thing, you know, core is really something that represents a, you know, a stability. It represents an, an ability, not a, not a, it's not a thing. It's not a, you know, something to wrap up with a bow and give as a present. You know what I mean? It's, it's, a. Uh, it was hard to get people to understand that, you know, core is from the, you know, from the bottom of your big toe to the top of your head mm -hmm. and people didn't necessarily in the beginning really understand that. They, they just went with this whole movement of core stability. And, and eventually I think, you know, that it's, Obviously, the education side of things and the progression evolution of it has has kind of weeded out that thought process for the most part. But and uh, you know, over here it's been much much different. To be honest, I think I've also been in a different environment over here than I was in the states. I, I had the opportunity to be in the private sector in the states. Here, I've been within the bubble of a professional organization, and you really don't get a whole lot of outside influence. You know, you on occasion the players will have worked with other people that have kind of ingrained certain thought processes in their head, so that when when you now go to train them and you try to educate them and what you want to do and how we're going to get there. Sometimes they have a preconceived idea of how to get there, and it might not be the one that's the most modern and most progressive anywhere, and sometimes you'll have a small bit of resistance, and that's about it. But for the most part, uh, you know, I've, I've had a pretty, pretty resistance-free experience out here so far. 
So when you when you take a lot of your components and training, as an example, do you uh, do you focus more on all the the um, applications throughout? Do you when you periodize your program? Do you think of linear or more of an undulated model when you plan your programming? I think it's kind of it's a bit difficult within within football because. Um, it, the schedule doesn't really lend itself to being very clean in terms of periodization. So, um, you know, I think of it more in terms of just uh, once you've assessed the player's needs, you know, I think you can take their needs and you can, you can kind of schedule them in a way where you can provide some variety for the player. So, for instance, if I have a particular individual, very, very powerful maybe not very stable. Um, they maybe have some um, more needs in terms of the area of flexibility and, and stability than anything else. Maybe some absolute strength needs or uh, maybe particular, you know, prehab need, whatever it might be. I think I like more to focus on one area of their needs for a certain, you know, period of time and then slowly progress that into a different focus and so on and so forth so that even at the times when the schedule doesn't allow it, I can I can definitely have an alternative to go to that's within the construct of the needs that they have and still know that no matter what I do, if I've only 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes to work, I know I'm benefiting them. I, in this particular field, I've just learned that um, you know, training out there or on the field takes priority, and I think it should. You know, we don't we don't go out on a Saturday and see who can lift the heaviest dumbbell. We go out on a Saturday and see who collectively as a group can put a better performance together and come up with a result. And, th and that comes down to training out there. What I do in here is help them do it successfully, help them do it safely, help them to do it uh, as, 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 you know, cleanly physically as possible. So when I get the opportunity to work with them here, I don't think anything I do should take longer than 20 minutes. And you get them in. You're focused, you're concentrated, you do the work you need, and you get them away. And you make sure that it's something that is a supplement to what they're doing out, out on the training pitch, and, and it allows them to perform better out there. And that sometimes uh, is hard for young strength coaches to understand that we're not the priority, nor, nor should we be. We are a part of the team that provides what the players need, not you know the piece to the puzzle. We're a piece to the puzzle, and sometimes our egos can get in the way of that, but... You know, for me, for the most part, I think periodization in general should allow for the adaptive process to take place. And that means there needs to be some loading, some functional overreaching, and then an opportunity to recover from those things. During that recovery, I can then go into another need. It might be a mobility need. It might be a flexibility need. And you can, you can use the different needs that the player has and use that as what you know allows you to periodize, and I, that's so that's kind of the way I've used it. And then there's times when you just got to offload them all together, let them play, let them perform, let the physical side of their preparations maybe take a little bit of a break, a little bit of a breather, and then come back to it again, in in a, in a way that allows for the progression to take place in a natural way. So it's a little bit difficult in this in this uh, particular setting, but um, you know, I, I think that's probably the way I handle it more than anything else. I, and if you had to label it, it would probably be somewhat undulating, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a work in progress out here that doesn't necessarily have the most steady schedule to stick with. No, I mean, I think that's a common, I think that's a common thing that happens in everyone's program, first of all. Um, it's just nice to have it discussed because quite often I think we're just so ingrained to think in, in how we've been certified or how we've been taught of this right. linear periodization model and this, then the undulated periodization model and people um, just like yourself, uh, you know, you said before, which is they get so ego driven that you're like, well, it's about, I got to get my, you know, three sets of five in, or I got to get, you know, my power lifting in, or I got to get my box jumping in when you need to take a step back and look at the whole picture that you're just a part of this and you need to complement it. And I think quite often people, you know, that's where technology helps sometimes. That's where also being aware and um, hearing and uh, being open enough to uh, ask better questions and be a critical thinker. 
uh, you know, kind of that's yeah. really the nature of what you just shared right there is I think hopefully people can really get because that's really important to really adapt to and grow with the opportunity that you've been presented with. Um, so when you work with your team, do you work more one-on-one -on -one with each athlete or do you sometimes have the opportunity of maybe grouping like a group A, group B, and group C that kind of get deployed into your programming? I think the because of the way we kind of have uh, our staffing set up, we get to we get to get down to pretty small numbers. In general, when we're out on the training pitch and we have a specific physical theme um, from a uh, from a from a you know conditioning standpoint, uh, myself along with others that are you know part of the department, we get to implement things. Um, and incorporate them into the, you know, to the physical training, that, you know, the theme of the day outside. And that allows us to have a, a bit of a, you know, a, a group, uh, a, you know, a big group type of session where we can work on things uh, collectively the team needs. Uh, then when we have, when, we, when the players come inside, that's when we really kind of split ourselves up and allow players within certain groups, uh, small groups, grouped together by you know similar needs, can work with different coaches and and um, and get a little bit more focused on things that are specific to their you know to their uh, to their needs. So uh, we've we don't get down to one on one per se, but we can get pretty we can get pretty darn close. And that uh, I think the players definitely appreciate that, especially when it comes down to I don't know maybe groups that have a little bit uh, a little bit more complicated medical history. We, we can still, still address some uh, some rehabilitative needs that need to be continually um, you know focused on, and, and that allows us to do that. But we've got a great group of uh, uh, physios over here who have tremendous working knowledge from a strength and conditioning background, who who can go from manual work to you know integrated functional movement into conditioning, and it they can the athlete can stay with that person the whole entire time. Uh, same thing with our fitness coaches. Many of the fitness coaches here are either physical therapists like myself or, or physios who can, who can maybe take it in the opposite direction if, if it needs to be. So we've got a, a, a great staff here that can allow us to be pretty specific. So do you think there's a big difference between um, UEFA and MLS currently? Yeah, I mean, from, I think in several different standpoints. Physically, if you were just to look, at you know athleticism for athleticism, um, MLS has tremendous athletes. So does the Premier League. It's it's one of those um, it's one of those areas of football that where American players excel. We we generally are very very committed to to being athletic within the American population. You know technically there's there's still a, a pretty big gap in terms of the overall ability. Uh, within the Premier League versus within within Major League Soccer, the I think that's just going to become a natural point of progression for for the league for for MLS. We've already I've already seen the progression in terms of the improvement without a doubt. Where you know when will it or will it ever be on you know level par with with European leagues is difficult to say. But the you know, the overall progression in MLS and the is visible, you know, year by year. So uh, there's still a gap. There's definitely still a gap. Physically, uh, you know, you could argue that the best players are the best athletes as well, for the most part. So do I feel like the Premier League might have, a, you know, a greater population of outstanding athletes? I think that might be the case. But then again, my experience in both leagues has only been with one team in each league. I can only compare my team in Columbus with my team in uh, in, in in the Premier League. I, I really, you know, I've watched other teams play I've, in both leagues. But until you're really in the club and you you work with players on a one-on-one -on -one basis and really get to see them work, see them move, you really can't make a comment on their athleticism, from a, a detailed comment on their athleticism. But overall. Uh, you know, for the most part, I do generally feel like there's probably just a bit more elite athleticism in the Premier League than there is in MLS. Um, but again, American athletes are always known for their dedication and for their commitment uh, and for their, for their probably their overall commitment to athleticism from a very, very young age. So 
uh, not, not, a, not, not as big, big of a gap, gap physically, physically as, as there is technically. Hmm. Well, first of all, I want to thank you and, and uh, for really taking the time out. This was awesome. I had lots of fun. Um, I want to tell everyone that's that's viewing this right now that we will have a, a roundtable discussion between uh, Coach Tajan, uh, Coach T Tenney from uh, the Seattle Sounders, Coach yeah. West from the University of Connecticut, and Scott Moody, uh, who actually has his own facility uh, and trains a lot of the whole age category. Um, so you'll get a, a great roundtable discussion here of, of everyone. Um, that will be coming real soon. Um, so again, thank you, Coach Tajan, for taking the time. Um, no problem. It was good seeing you again. It was great so seeing you. And uh, I look forward to uh, our future meeting. All right, right man. Take care. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.